You know, I used to like that Footprints poem, you know, the one that's in everybody's bathroom. You know, the, there are two sets of footprints, and then there's just one, and the guy's walking with Jesus. He's like, man, there's only one set of footprints. What's happened? Like, oh, that's that's when, I, when I carried you. That's why there's only one step. There's never been a day where we had our own footprints. Oh, I promised Danny after day camp yesterday, and you know we walked ten miles taking kids to the bathroom. That this would probably be a short sermon, so <laughs> you can all you can all thank Danny. Um, well, this morning uh, we're going to finish up the the fifth beatitude uh, with with one of the most famous passages in in all of the gospel. So if you got a Bible, go ahead and flip it to John eight because that's that's where we're going to be. Uh, we got three Beatitudes left after this morning, and I hope that you're starting to see the picture that, that Jesus is painting of, of what, a, what a citizen of the kingdom of heaven looks like. You know, as I've tried to say all along, Beatitudes are not random. Uh, with each one, Jesus is just adding another image to the, or another layer to the image. See, citizens of the kingdom, they, they recognize their spiritual poverty, not only do they recognize it, they, they mourn over it. And they, they trust completely in their king and in his power, no matter what's going on around them. They hunger after his righteousness, not their own. And they're satisfied in it, knowing that their own righteousness will just leave them hungry, and it'll leave them searching, and it'll leave them wanting. And finally, they, they become distributors of mercy and forgiveness uh, because of the mercy and forgiveness that they've been shown by, by their king. How could there be any other result, right? And so far this month, we, we've looked at, we've looked at uh, an account of a slave who was forgiven this ungodly amount of money by this benevolent and generous king, only for him to turn right around and refuse to forgive a fellow slave who owed him a few bucks in comparison. The king ended up revoking his mercy and revoking his forgiveness because he refused to extend that same forgiveness that he'd been given to somebody else. Do with that what you will. But never forget the question that was asked that led to that parable in the first place. Remember, Peter came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, how many times should I forgive a brother when he sins against me? It was the wrong question. Last week, Zach came and he expounded on the biblical account of Jonah and he did a great job. I got to listen to that. And Jonah was this prophet of God of all people. And not only did he not want to travel to preach to a nation that he didn't like, but he flat out got angry when that nation repented and received forgiveness from God. Like you'd think a prophet, somebody who speaks the words of God, somebody who carries out God's message to the people, you would think that they'd be happy that someone chose to listen to them in the first place because most of the time they were ignored. But Jonah, he just throws this massive hissy fit. He wanted those people to get what they deserved. Can you relate? Like, do you often find yourself wanting people to get what they deserve? We, we've, we've asked that question a few times over the last month. As I was thinking about Jonah and on that question, I, I saw the news uh, when, when we were at Amber's parents' house. And um, I, I saw about this school shooting in, in Texas. And I was glad that Zach was preaching for me the next week on mercy of all things. Because... It's just really easy to wish people get what they deserve. It's really easy to not want people to receive mercy, especially when they do something that I think is heinous or I think is terrible. It's just really easy, especially for me, to look at certain things that certain people do and just wish God would just strike them down like lightning from heaven right there. And if I can see it, all the better. And there will be a day when, when God will unleash justice upon his enemies and upon this earth. And we can certainly rejoice in that. Like th there will be a reckoning. And I think that's a good thing. But I don't really think it does us any good uh, to just have this unhealthy obsession with God's judgment. I mean, it's certainly not a good thing if we love watching other people get caught in their sins. And we love watching them get in trouble for their sins. Like any parents in this room who have more than one child will understand this. Or, or any teachers in the room, especially if you, if you teach elementary age children, you'll understand this. Kids often love it when other kids get in trouble. Amen? Like, have you seen this with your own kids? Or if you're a teacher, you've seen this in your classroom? Like, I see it with my girls all the time. 
Like one of them will do something naughty. And then the one who was quote unquote being good, they cannot wait to tell me what their sister has done as soon as I walk in the door. Like it's no hug, it's no nothing. Sometimes Addie will even call me on the phone now to tell me what her sister has done. And like they have more interest in their sister getting in trouble than you can possibly imagine. It had happened this morning. I, I was trying to get ready in here and my phone rang and it was Addie and she said, Dad, you'll never guess what Audrey did. It looked like she was hiding something and I went and I found the Nintendo and she was playing the game that you told her not to play. What are you going to do about it? And... Um, they want each other to get in trouble. They love it. It's like a movie. It's fun for them. And they will remind me of anything and everything that I have ever said about a certain behavior and the complete list of punishments that you know, I've kind of laid out on the household. They're like, Dad, you said if this happened again that you would do this and that this would happen. You can't go against your word. And they're just waiting for me to act. It's, it's, it's nuts. I, I know I'm not alone in this. I don't think it's uncommon for kids. Now, where it shouldn't be common is with adults. But sadly, I think it's true that some of us never outgrow wanting to watch others get in trouble for what they've done. I think, honestly, this is why so many people are obsessed with the Johnny Depp trial. How many of you watched it? Let's be honest. Okay, there's a few of you honest people in church. <laughs> I, I saw it a little bit. Like, and I made the mistake of looking in like the comment section and, and all that. And like, man, so many people could not wait for that verdict to be read. Like one person was guilty in, in the public opinion from, from day one. I was like, I can't wait to see her get what they deserve. You know, justice for all this. And I was like, man, people cannot stand this person. This is, this is terrible. But I really do. I, I think we just love to see people get what, what we think they deserve. Because honestly, if, if, we're, if we're waiting to see others get in trouble for their sins, right? We're obviously not worrying too much about our own. So I get it. And I know this isn't exactly the same, but I stumbled across this verse a couple of times over the last couple months. And it's out of Proverbs chapter 24. Here's what it says. It says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Isn't that interesting? Don't, don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Don't get excited when you see him trip up, when you see him mess up. Because God, God sees that. And look, I get it. It's a whole lot easier to look outward than it is to look inward. It's a lot more fun for me to watch you than to look at me. But if we constantly want God to punish others, part of the reason for that has to be even subconsciously we think, you know, we like that because if he's punishing others, he's not punishing us. Like the, the spotlight is off of us for a little bit. And see, sometimes I think we do forget about our own sin when we, when we face the sin of other people. Like we've forgotten that the same sin that separates them from God also separates us. We are them. Well, the exact details may be different, but, but the nature isn't. Like, may we never forget that we were completely dead when God gave us life. Like, may we never forget that we didn't have a family when God chose to adopt us into his. In John chapter 8, we witness one of the, the most familiar events in, in the life of Christ. And part of it honestly reminds me of my own kids. You know, somebody's caught in their sin... And the religious leaders, they want to know what Jesus is going to do about it. I mean, the text is clear. They, they want to trap Jesus by what he says. They're trying to lay a trap for him, trying to get him to stumble in what he says. And if he says one thing, they think he's going to break God's law. But, but if he says the opposite thing, then, then he's going to break the Roman law. So they think they have Jesus in a catch-22. They think they have him trapped. They're playing chess, right? And they think they've got Jesus in checkmate. But in the middle of their chess game is a very real woman. Uh, to them, she's just a pawn. But Jesus sees through it all. He sees through her. He sees through them. He sees everything. And it says in John chapter 8, verse 2, 
It says, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Or what are you going to do about it? They said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. I have so many questions when I read this text. You probably do too. You know, the first question, no particular order of the questions, but how, how was this woman caught in the act of adultery? Like, we all know what adultery is, right? Like, we don't have to spell it out. Like, how was this woman caught in the act? Like, did somebody just happen to walk by an open window at the right time? They've been watching this woman before? Like, they've they, they been following her? Like, they know this was going to happen? They're like, we're, we're going to put somebody outside the door. We're going to listen, or we're going to put somebody outside the window who's going to watch. Like, then it's like, was it common to just grab a sinner all the time and throw them in front of Jesus while he's teaching? Like, Jesus, this person did this. What are you going to do about it? It's like, what's their motivation? I know the text tells us that they wanted to test him so they could bring a charge against him. I get that. But I've got so many questions about this text because it smells like a setup any way you look at it. And then what I love about this is the religious leaders, they have the audacity to use scripture to justify everything that they're doing. Is anybody familiar with what the law says about adultery? Okay, anybody? Anybody? Let's read a couple verses out of the law just for fun to see, to see what in the world they're talking about. Like, where are they getting what they're doing? This is where they said that they had the authority to say that this woman who they caught in the act of adultery deserved death. She, she deserved to be hit by rocks until she was dead. I'm going to read these, these couple of verses where they get what they're talking about. See if you notice anything strange. All right, Leviticus 20, verse 10, it says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor... Both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. In Deuteronomy 22, 22, If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. What do you notice when you read that? Like, what's weird about this, this whole thing? There is no man. That's my other big question. Like, where is the man? They're missing half of the equation here. Like, I heard a pastor say this once. I think I've said this before, but swimming, that's a solo sport. Cycling, that's a solo sport. Adultery, that's a team sport, right? It, it takes two people to commit adultery. Like, there is somebody missing from the equation here. Takes two to tango. And while this woman got caught in the act of adultery, and while she gets thrown in front of Jesus, like it seems like this man got a got a get out of jail free card here or something. I mean, maybe he was one of the religious leaders there. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if there were any limits to how far they'd go to trap Jesus. I mean, death certainly wasn't off the table. But here's, here's what I noticed, though, about this text. These religious leaders were really comfortable hiding behind their Bible verses while at the same time condemning this woman to death. They didn't care about the woman at all. She, she was just a pawn in their game with Jesus. See, they saw her sin. And Jesus saw a sinner who needed salvation. They just believed her sin was a convenient way to trap Jesus. And the, the trap was this, like, if Jesus agreed with them that she should die and had encouraged them to stone her, he would have broken Roman law because capital punishment was, was forbidden. Like, it had to be carried out by the Romans. That's why the Jews have to, have to get Pilate to crucify Jesus. They can't do it themselves. But on the other hand, if Jesus said that she didn't deserve to die for adultery, then he would have been st seen as standing opposed to God's law. Like, Jesus, it says this, you're, you're saying something opposite? You're not a great moral teacher. You don't come from God. Certainly not. So what does he do? We read it. The text says that he, he bends down and he starts to write in the dirt. We have no idea what he was writing. 
But, but this, I think, is the only time we witness Jesus writing anything in Scripture. And people have speculated lots of things. They've, they've said uh, maybe he was writing down some of the sins of the religious leader. Maybe he was calling them out like, Bob, you, I know you did this. James, you did this. I don't know. Some have speculated that he wrote down the actual commandments that they were supposedly standing behind. Maybe he underlined the word both and man and woman. It's like, where is the man? We don't know what he wrote. But we do know that when they kept pestering him, he stood up and he said something that nobody was expecting him to say. John 8 verse 7 says this. It says, And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And the text goes on, it says he he bent back down and he started writing in the dirt again. I'm sure you could have heard a pin drop or a rock. Jesus cut right to the heart of the matter and he refused to play into their hands. See, the religious leaders, they, they saw somebody else's sin. And up to that point, they refused to acknowledge their own sin. They they were crying out for punishment for this woman, all the while forgetting that their own sins called for the same punishment. There was no room for mercy in their judgment. They just wanted her to get what she deserved. She'd been caught in the act. And it, it was really convenient, especially if it helped them to trap Jesus. Because the ends always justify the means, right? And it's easy to look at them and want them to get what they deserved. But, but then we're right back at square one, aren't we? Like, this is one of the reasons Jesus is such a good teacher. You can't beat him at his game. See, he always forces us to get right to the heart of the issue. When Jesus forces them to acknowledge the reality of their own sinfulness, they begin to walk away one by one. They drop their stones as they leave, the oldest to the youngest, it says. And eventually, Jesus is left alone with this woman. Now, what's he going to do? Right? If anybody could have thrown a stone at her righteously, if anybody could have passed righteous judgment on this woman, it was Jesus. It was the person standing in front of her. Because he knows all things. He sees all things. Like He knows exactly who this woman is. He knows exactly what she was caught doing. But look at verse 10. It says, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What he says to her is pretty incredible. Like the one who could have righteously judged her for her sins did not. Now he didn't say she didn't sin. He told her to sin no more, so, so he, he clearly didn't ignore the sin. But, but here's something I, I've been wondering about lately. A pastor friend of mine once asked me this question, and it made me really angry when he asked it to me. And now it, it doesn't make me so angry. I, I, th- I think I can see what he was trying to get at. Here, here was his question to me. We were talking about this passage, and I, I, I was having some trouble with it, just go, kind of going back and forth. It's like, man, what is Go and sin no more. Like, what what is this even talking about? And then he asked me this question. He said, said, Brandon, is Jesus commanding her not to sin anymore? Or is he pronouncing that she's no longer a sinner? Like, obviously, we're all going to be sinners. But but go with me for, for just a moment. Was he commanding her not to sin anymore? Like, giving her a commandment, don't do this. Or, or, or was he pronouncing a new identity upon her? Because here's what I think, and granted, I could always be wrong, but if Jesus is telling her to never sin again, it seems like he's setting her up for an impossible task. How many of you could never sin again if Jesus sat by you and told you right now to never sin again? Because I'm, I'm standing up here right now telling you that I, I would fail that by the end of the day. See, there's some Christian denominations out there who believe if you sin after you've been baptized that you're out of luck. And that's often kind of unknowingly how we teach, I think. It's like, oh, you're forgiven for all your past sins when you get baptized, but very rarely do we talk about future sins. Like, I want you to know this morning, the blood of Christ covers all of your sins, past, present, and future. 
In the words of our very own Josh Harp, I'll probably butcher it, but he said something while he taught a Romans class. Something about, you know, the, the grace that saved you is, is the grace that keeps you saved. He can probably say it better than me. But that's how good of a Savior he is. Like, that's how loving of a God he is. That's how good of a gift you've been given. It wouldn't be much of a, a redemption or much of a salvation if we could throw it away in a day. If Jesus is telling her that any future sin in her life would result in her condemnation, that wouldn't be any kind of good news. Like, I'd be terrified. It's like, oh, man, I hope I don't screw up. I hope I, I got to walk perfect. Man, I, I would be on pins and needles like you wouldn't believe. But if Jesus is conferring upon her a new identity, then the commandment actually turns into a pronouncement. I could be completely nuts, but, but I, I think it's something definitely worth thinking about. See, when Jesus could have rightly condemned her, and judged her for her sins. He showed her mercy. He gave her something she did not deserve. He also showed her grace. He did not treat her as her sins deserved. That's mercy. He, he didn't gloat that he could righteously punish her. Like I believe he saw past her sin and saw into her need for a Savior. And what he did for her, he did for all of those who are in Christ. Like he took her sin and he took my sin and he took your sin and he eventually bore it upon the cross. Like he paid the penalty that we each should have paid. Like God righteously dealt with sin once and for all, past, present, future, but he dealt with it in the person of his son. He, he dealt with it in the person of Christ on the cross. Like you want to know how good this, this gift is that he's given us? Like we deserve to be disowned forever and he adopts us. Like, we don't deserve any kind of an inheritance except eternal death, but he makes us heirs to life everlasting. Like, death couldn't hold him, and it's not going to hold us either because of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Like, he defeated sin. He defeated death. Our, our two greatest enemies, they are done with. They're vanquished forever. Like, you know this, but, but do you know it? So what sort of people ought we to be? We'll just sum this up with, with, with the beatitude. Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Would you pray with me? God.